According to some, it's about protecting civilians. And our resolve is clear. The people of Libya must be protected. Others say it's about oil. The only reason they're interested in, with Libya is about the oil. You'd think we'd be in Iraq if the major export there was broccoli. But some are convinced intervention in Libya is all about currency, specifically Gaddafi's plan to introduce the gold dinar, a single African currency made from gold, a true sharing of the wealth. It's one of these things that you have to plan almost in secret. Because as soon as you say you're going to change over from the dollar to the something else, you're going to be targeted. There were two conferences on this, one in uh, 96 and another one in the year 2000, called the World Mataba Conference, organized by Gaddafi. And uh, everybody was interested, and I think most countries in Africa were keen. Gaddafi didn't give up. In the months leading up to the military intervention, he called on African and Muslim nations to join together to create this new currency that would rival the dollar and euro. They would sell oil and other resources around the world only for gold dinars. It's an idea that would shift the economic balance of the world. Countries' wealth would depend on how much gold they have, not how many dollars they trade. And Libya has 144 tons of gold. The UK has double that, but 10 times the population. If Gaddafi uh, had an intent to try to uh, reprice his oil or whatever else the, uh, the country was uh, selling in the global markets and accept something else as a currency or maybe launch a gold in our currency, any move such as that would certainly not be welcomed by the power elite today who are responsible for controlling the world's central banks. So yes, that would certainly be something that would cause his immediate dismissal and the need for other reasons to, uh, to be brought forth for removing him from power. It's happened before. In 2000, Saddam Hussein announced Iraqi oil would be traded in euros, not dollars. Sanctions and an invasion followed. Some say because the Americans were desperate to prevent OPEC from transferring oil trading in all its member countries to the euro. A gold dinar would have had serious consequences for the world financial system, but may also have empowered the people of Africa, something black activists say the U.S. wants to avoid at all costs. The United States should welcome the self-determination of Africans. They certainly have denied self-determination to Africans inside the United States, so we're not surprised by anything that the United States would do to hinder self-determination of Africans on the continent. The UK's gold is kept here in a secure vault somewhere in the depths of the Bank of England. As in most developed countries, there's not enough to go around. But that's not the case in places like Libya and many of the Gulf states. A gold dinar would have given oil-rich African and Middle Eastern countries the power to turn around to their energy-hungry customers and say, sorry, the price has gone up and we want gold. Some say the US and its NATO allies literally couldn't afford to let that happen. Laura Emmett, RT. You remember a number of months ago, the World Bank and the IMF, oh, come on now, you got to pick some buzzwords out. These are so important to your life and to your dinner table, you can't imagine it. You remember about three, four months ago, the World Bank and the IMF said, oh, and they made themselves look so good. They said, we're going to forgive the loans of every third world country and every nation, every third world nation in the world. We're going to forgive their loans. Oh, didn't they look like such benevolent people? No, not on your life. First thing I thought in my mind was, come on now, nobody forgives a loan unless somebody pays for it. They weren't doing you a favor. You know who paid off the third, the loans of every third world country? You know who paid them off? You did. And you did. And you did. And I did. Where? At the gas pump? You don't know this. I would have never known it had I not sat in their board meetings, had I not rubbed shoulders with them, sat across the dinner table from them. Most authors would have given anything to be able to even rub shoulders with these people one time. I lived with them for three years. I don't have to research somebody else's material and write a book. I wrote a book from what I lived for three years' time, and I'm here to tell you so you can save your family and your dinner table, and we can help turn America around.
Who are they? Saudi Arabia, any oil producing country of the world, they sell their oil to the men who sit behind the computers in New York and London every day and they're representatives of the World Bank and the IMF and they're the ones that make the difference between what Saudi Arabia gets a barrel of oil out of the ground. You know how much Saudi Arabia, how much it costs them to get a barrel of oil out of the ground? It costs them five dollars. Who's making that between that and seventy dollars a barrel? They sell it to the oil boards. Their representatives sit behind the computers in New York and London. They tell everybody on the face of the earth what they're going to give them for a barrel of oil for that day. OPEC has nothing to do with it. Shell Oil Company has nothing to do with it. You don't have anything to do with it. Price and demand has nothing to do with it. It's controlled by the men who sit behind the computers in New York and London every day. They're representatives of the World Bank and the IMF, and they take the big cut right off the top before the oil company ever gets theirs, and they could forgive the loans of every third world country because you paid for it at the gas pump and it's an atrocity and if the world ever wakes up they're going to overthrow the powers that be and the people will be we the people again. Now I'll give you the details. During the administration of President Carter there was a man by the name of Mr. Henry Kissinger. He went to every leading oil producing country in the world and he said, I'd like to cut you a deal. And they said, what? He said, we will send America's oil companies over to produce your fields. We'll make you rich. You'll be the wealthiest people on the face of the earth. You must sign on the dotted line to do two things. You may have heard this. Very few have. I would not had I not been there. You must do two things. Number one, you must denominate all oil sales in American dollars. Since 1960 and the inception of the great oil boom, all oil sales have been done in American dollars. Watch this carefully. You've got to know what to do when you go back to those booths over there in the exhibit room and you'd better do it today. Number one, you must denominate all, so all oil sales in American dollars. Number two, they said, what's that? We like the first one, solid as a dollar. You remember those days? What's number two? He said, you must take a certain percentage. I wish I knew that percentage. Somehow I missed it back in those days. He said, you must take a certain percentage of everything we buy oil from you with and you must turn around and invest it in American T-bills and securities. Basically, in a nutshell, the oil producing countries of the world would buy our national debt nine trillion dollars. Watch out. Something has happened. Before I go into what has happened, may I say that two nations wouldn't sign on the dotted line. Who were they? Iraq? And I ran. A man appeared with me on a radio talk show the other day. Write his name down. It'll also be on the camera today. His name is Abner Deathridge. He was the man, one of the men, sent by the State Department of the United States of America to Saddam Hussein back in February through March of 1990 and said, if you invade Kuwait, the State Department and the United States of America will do nothing about it. It was a setup. It was a trap. Saddam didn't know it. Saddam had to be destroyed because he wouldn't sign on this dotted line. That's the only reason. There are a lot of people in the world that have murdered more people than Saddam Hussein did. I'm not taking up for him. I know he was a wicked man. But I'm telling you the facts. And here he, he, they, he did. What did he do? You remember that Kuwait had been a part of Iraq prior to the last war. And when the world was divided up after the last war by the powers that be, Kuwait was taken away from Iraq. And so the statement, uh, so Saddam said, I want Iraq back. He went and invaded it on August the 1st, 1990. And immediately after that, who came down on him? Why? It was a setup. All President Bush Sr. wanted was an excuse to invade Saddam to get back at him because Saddam was not willing to sign on the dotted line in the days of Henry Kissinger. What was the second nation that was not willing to sign on the dotted line? Iran. It's not nuclear. 
What's happening in Iran has nothing at all to do with nuclear. Iran is years away from producing a nuclear bomb. Why are we using nuclear as an excuse to invade Iran or to do something about Iran or put sanctions on Iran? North Korea has the bomb. China has the bomb. On and on and on. Israel. You could go on and on with the countries that have the bomb. Why are we sing it out Iran who doesn't even have one yet? Because Iran would not sign on the dotted line in the days of Mr. Henry Kissinger and they must be destroyed at any price even if you Americans have to pay the lives of your sons to go there and do it.